This year I can't start my video. <laughs> if my face too dark, maybe I need to get a lamp. Uh... Right? I don't know if this is better. Yeah, that's better. Is it better? Still a bit dark. Huh? Maybe put right behind. Put behind me. Yeah. I mean, oh wait. Oh. Near the camera, the webcam. Near the webcam. Oh. Yeah, this is much better, I think. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can I just test my slide whether I can see? Uh... Mm -hmm. What do you see? Yeah, we can see your slide. The, the whole clear. slide. You don't see the notes, right? Not that I No, know. just the slide. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Oh, people are in already. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Hope you're having a great Sunday. All healthy and staying safe at home. Okay, we are still waiting for more to join us. So we shall wait for another five minutes. In the meantime, for those who are already in, feel free to grab a cup of coffee or do a little bit of stretching because today's topic will be an interesting one.
Pardon me. We can see more joining us. Hi to those who have just logged in. Uh, we are just warming up and waiting for the rest to join us, but we shall be starting anytime soon. Okay, let me go over a few things before we start. Uh, the entire session will be recorded and the chat box is open throughout the webinar. So feel free to ask and type your questions in the chat box. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. And we will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Hello to those who have just joined us. Let's wait for a couple more minutes, okay? Good morning to, have, to those who have just joined us. Hope you have had your breakfast. How about you, doctor? Have you had yours? Not yet. <laughs> I, I, think, I think better on an empty stomach. Uh, okay. Which batch are you, Amalia? Um, batch 24. Yeah. Okay, sorry, what, what year are you in? Year 4. Year 4. Yeah. Uh, and then what, winter, summer batch, does it still exist? Oh, um, our batch is the last um, batch following that system. Yeah, oh. I mean the winter batch. Ah, yeah. Okay. So what system is it after that? Just uh, one. One, one batch one a batch year? One batch per year, yeah. No ah. longer two batches. All right, it's 11.05, shall we begin? Okay. I am Amalia, the moderator for today's webinar. First of all, allow me to introduce the speaker for today. Dr. Kuo Eugene obtained his Bachelor of Dental Surgery, BDS, with first class from Penang International Dental College, PIDC, in 2011. He went on to serve in the public sector for two and a half years before joining and see a dental specialist, practicing as general, general dentist with special interest in periodontology from 2014 to 2017. During this period, he obtained his membership in the Faculty of Dental Surgery from the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh. He went on to complete his specialist training in periodontology, McClendon, at UCL Eastman Dental Institute, London, and obtained his membership in periodontology from the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh later that year. His, years of, his areas of interest include uh, focusing on achieving periodontal health, patient communication, and periodontal surgery. 
Dr. Eugene is also a member of the European Federation of Periodontology, EFP, International Team for Implantology, ITI, and the Academy of Osseo Integration, AO. As a founding member of PIDC alumni, Dr. Eugene served as president for two years and is actively involved in organizing voluntary work and teaching young dental professionals. He has obtained a UCL Medical School training to teach certificate as part of this pursuit and plans to continue this in the future. Away from practice, he enjoys traveling, history, food, and table tennis. Without further ado, let us welcome Dr. Eugene. Dr. Eugene, the floor is yours. Or should I say the screen is yours. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Amalia, uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, and thank you, PIDC and PVC, for organizing uh, an online platform uh, for all to share. Uh, you know, shows that we're all adapting well, living in these extraordinary times of a pandemic uh, for more than a year. So again, thank you for spending your Sunday morning with me. Uh, I hope to make your time worthwhile. I tried to keep this uh, interesting to show you, to prove to you that Perio is not boring. <laughs> And, uh, you know, to, I kept it light and minimally academic. Uh, but I do have a bit of homework <clears throat> for you guys at the end of the day. Uh, and the homework is just kind of for you to, to think. I hope to provoke your thoughts today. And um, yeah, you will find out soon. So let's begin. So yeah, as the nice brochure uh, advertise, I'm going to cover four aspects. So the first one is the trends and impact of periodontitis. Uh, in this uh, section, I'm just going to try to expand your view on what we think periodontitis is and what the whole world is doing, uh, putting perio into perspective. So from that kind of big area to come down, um, you know, to see uh, how, or why are we important in the healthcare? You know, why do we call ourselves doctors? Are we really do we really deserve that title? Uh, and then I'll go into a little bit of uh, litigation and the ugly truth. Um, this will, it's not all um, uh, roses and sunshine uh, in uni like in university. Uh, the real world is, um, can be quite scary. And of course, whether there is a future for you, is this for you, is perio for you? Can you do perio? Uh, what is it going to be like in the private practice? So, yep, let's begin. So, this is the, probably the most boring bit, uh, coming to definitions again. So, this is the latest definition by the EFP that came out last year. Uh, and I don't want you to memorize this. I don't like kind of memorizing. Uh, it's important to understand and you never have to memorize. So, I've highlighted three uh, key words of, in this definition. Number one is that uh, it is an inflammatory disease is associated with dysbiotic plaque, uh, plaque biofilm. And then as a result, it is, uh, it's a destruction of two supporting uh, structures. So if you notice that there is two components to it, firstly it is um, the etiology is mentioned, which is uh, a dysbiotic plaque film. Dysbiotic just means that uh, the community of bacteria in the plaque is just not balanced, right? It's, um, and when it's not balanced, it becomes uh, pathogenic or it becomes dangerous basically uh, in this sense. Um, and uh, what they have put along with the definition are the primary features. And I think this picture sums it up quite well. Loss of periodontal tissue support. Uh, this includes clinical attachment loss, as you can see. Uh, radiographic bone loss, there are no x-rays, but uh, it's quite clear that you would see some uh, heart tissue loss. Presence of periodontal pocketing, yeah, I don't need to do that as well. Gingival bleeding. In addition to these primary features, there are there is loss of teeth, loss of function as well, uh, your posterior support. So all this will be classic periodontitis. Now on to your homework. So um, actually, it's just one question uh, for you to think. So if the etiology, as I mentioned, is um, bacterial in nature then why can't we treat periodontitis with antibiotics alone? Uh, is it so far-fetched to come up with that statement? Um, this is what probably our medical counterparts think, right? Ah, 
antibiotics are not important. It's a bacterial disease, why can't we just prescribe antibiotics? And it's not so far-fetched because if you can imagine if that is true, and if somebody develops a caries vaccine, we are all out of a job. And there is people researching into caries vaccines. The idea has been floating around for, I don't know, at least 10, 20 years. So something for you to think about. And I would also probably want you to ask whoever you may be, ask your lecturers, ask your, your mentors, your, your professors, ask them and see what you get. Okay, so <clears throat> periodontal disease. Uh, periodontal disease or periodontitis. Now, this is what I um, find quite common mistake is that uh, people always get confused with periodontal disease or periodontitis. So I'm going to once and for all say this because um, I get it in my referral letters. I get it when my colleagues talk to me. Um, you have to be very clear. Periodontal disease includes gingivitis and periodontitis, whereas periodontitis is periodontitis, right? So why is this important to make a distinction is because two key points, if you remember today, is that gingivitis, number one, is reversible, whereas periodontitis is considered largely irreversible. And very important is that it is a precursor to periodontitis. And what does this mean? It means that periodontitis cannot happen if the gingivitis does not precede it. So gingivitis, in a way, is a warning sign. And that's the reason why it is important to distinguish and important to treat gingivitis um, uh, with seriously. So, um, yeah, so don't be confused by periodontal disease or periodontitis. Now, there's a picture of a hand on the right-hand side. So it's quite interesting, this paper done in 2001, this researcher, uh, he counted the surface of an inflamed uh, dental gingival surface. He basically estimated the surface area of the inflamed gingiva of a patient with periodontitis. And uh, he found that it's uh, eight centimeters squared, or oh, sorry, so 20 centimeters squared. And that is basically the size of your palm. Now, if you imagine that tomorrow you wake up and your palm is red and inflamed, will you not go and see a doctor? Will you not think it is something dangerous? So yeah, just to put things into perspective. It's fun. I mean, of course, this study has a lot of limitations, but uh, yeah. Uh, you basically wouldn't ignore it, so why would you ignore gingivitis? So uh, I mentioned just now it's an inflammatory disease. This is just kind of very roughly, uh, this is probably what we learn, you know, the, the, the cardinal signs of, of inflammation. Uh, this is an outdated concept. As you can see, the first four, your, what is it called again? Chalor, rubor, tumor, and dolor. Um, this was coined more than 2,000 years ago. And then in 1902, about 120 years ago, um, they added a fifth cardinal sign, which is loss of function. Now, this is um, a bit outdated because uh, we don't look at inflammation based on the signs. Uh, okay, let me give you an example. If you cut a finger, if, if you have a finger, if, sorry, if you have a cut on your finger, what happens is that it's going to be painful. Is going to be uh, around the area is going to be slightly inflamed or red, might swell a little bit, uh, and then well, probably too small to feel the heat. Uh, and then loss of function, you can't use your finger for a while. Right? So it is all why is this, although you know outdated, why is it still kind of relevant? Is because um, it shows it describes the situation, but the modern well, not I wouldn't even say modern concept, the now concept accepted concept about inflammation is completely different. When you get a cut on your finger, all the, the, the kind of police cells go to that area. But where do they come from? So it triggers actually a reaction all the way to your liver and your liver kind of sends a signal to say that, hey, you know, you need more cells, you need more help at that finger. So what I'm saying is that um, although you have a cut on your finger, your whole body becomes inflamed. It builds up a reaction to uh, your, the, the side of the finger. And uh, your whole body, all the inflammatory cells, uh, sorry, inflammatory markers start to circulate in your body just to reach that area. So this inflammation is designed to be 
a good thing, you know, to help our bodies, to defend our body. However, chronic inflammation is bad. It's similar to what's going on now in Malaysia. Um, you know, pre-COVID, you will see police and then you will say, hey, you know, the police, um, he will help you, he's nice to you and, and, and you know, if you're lost or, or, or you make a police report, it's fine. But now, because they are overwhelmed, they're placed to go so many roadblocks and they're so annoyed that you you start seeing, hearing um, news by saying that, you know, they don't let uh, people cross because now every Tom, Dick and Harry has a letter. And then what happens? In genuine cases, people don't go to hospital in time, they die, they lose their baby, etc., etc. So inflammation is good or the policemen are good, but if they are overwhelmed and it's chronic for over a year, um, it's no good. And it's the same for periodontitis. It's the same for other inflammatory disease. So anyway, uh, just to sum it up, this uh, is a little bit old model on the right-hand side uh, by Chapel. Just very, very briefly, the left column here, which is the microbial challenge or the bacteria, what happens is that it starts to disturb the host uh, inflammatory response. And it depends on which is your body immune system and how does it react. It can react both ways. If it reacts by not doing anything, resistant to it, then nothing, no disease will happen. But if not, it's going to trigger a reaction for the connective tissue and bone metabolism. And what happens is that then we manifest into clinical signs of the disease, which is the yellow bit on the right. And you notice above the two blue, above and below the two blue columns, there's environmental risk factors and genetic risk factors as well. So periodontitis, in that sense, it is a trigger versus a body response. And therefore, the picture on the left here, this guy, he's strong, he kicks away the bacteria, nothing happens. He doesn't fall sick or he doesn't get periodontitis. Right. So moving on to trends of periodontitis, uh, according to the Global Burden of Disease in 2007, uh, periodontitis is the sixth most prevalent health condition. And the prevalence of severe periodontitis is about 11%. And we can see here this red color thing here. Um, it's similar to sexually transmitted disease and um, diabetes and kidney disease. So it is quite serious. And this is a severe form of periodontitis. Um, right now, what is the prevalence in Malaysia? So this is all I could get. Malaysia, if you are not aware, has something called a National Oral Health Plan or NOSA. And it's basically a survey done every 10 years. So. Uh, I'm still waiting for the published result of the 2021. Um, for some reason, I can't find it. So this data is from 2010. Uh, and to, to sum it up, the prevalence of periodontal disease is about 94%, as you can see here. Uh, means almost everybody has periodontal disease. But remember what I said about periodontal disease. It's not the same as periodontitis. Now, I don't have the official figures here, but if I'm not mistaken, periodontitis is about 43% of Malaysians. So that's one in, almost one in two adults have periodontitis. And the severe form of periodontitis is about 13%, slightly higher than the uh, global average. So what I'm trying to put here, trying to put into perspective is that you cannot ignore perio. If 93% of Malaysians and globally have Perio, um, you cannot cannot ignore this. And if half of them requires more advanced treatment, which it is, then you definitely cannot ignore perio. So uh, this article came out just a few weeks ago by the Economist. Uh, it's a really large landmark, uh, what you call um, article. I'm happy to share the link with it. Uh, time to take gum disease seriously. So this is from an economist perspective, not from a dentist kind of perspective. And I sum it up to four big points, which I will kind of break down uh, one by one. So the first one is that prevention, diagnosis, and management of periodontitis on the long, in the long term is cost effective, right? So let's move on first. So they had many studies in, in Europe. I just took two, uh, the Netherlands and Italy. Um, and just to show you, can, can you see my mouse? Well, anyway, on the Netherlands, just put the baseline cost. Basically, they are spending 18 billion euros a year on their citizens to treat um, 
uh, what you call periodontitis or oral health. I, I think they clump it up together, the dental uh, kind of um, uh, needs. And if they were to treat only 10% of gingivitis, they would have to spend an additional 4 billion, right? Um, but if they eliminate gingivitis, they can save almost 8 billion. Now, the interesting thing is that if they treat all periodontitis cases, they really go hard on it, they have to spend about four times more, a whopping 72 billion to cure periodontitis in their country. Um, but what happens in the next 10 years is that they actually get a return of investment of 13.4, meaning that although they spend a whopping 72 billion uh, now, in 10 years, they actually save money. But who's going to spend 72 billion? But it's just putting things into perspective. Of course, this depends on each country's health system as well. Malaysia is uh, slightly different. I'll come to that. Italy is slightly different. I think the Italians can't count. They're already spending 96 billion and they spend four times more, which is a whopping 387 billion. Uh, their return on investment is not so good. So that's why I picked these two countries, uh, contrasting with each other. I mean, it's just interesting to see what's the point from an economist. Okay, so uh, Malaysia, we did a study actually by Muhammad Dong, uh, and this was in 2016. So they did similar kind of estimations and they found that they spent about 32 billion ringgit a year on periodontal problems. And periodontitis, as you can see, management of periodontitis. And our population is what, 32 million? So it's about a thousand ringgit per person. Of course, you know, babies and kids don't have um, periodontitis, so it's, it's, it's not necessary. But uh, basically, the estimation was this they need to spend an average of 2,820 ringgit, which is about 3,000 ringgit per person per year to solve periodontitis. That's how they get the figure of 32 billion. Um, and then here they break down stage two, stage three, but basically it's their own uh, version of uh, quantifying the severity of, of periodontitis. Uh, I mean, logically, if a patient is really severe and needs surgery, the cost is gonna go up. That, that's all we mean. Now, so coming on to the second summary of the, the, uh, the what you call the economist's um, public publication is that we need better integration between dental and medical. So, uh, and this includes diabetes. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on diabetes. You can go and watch this online lecture that I just went last month by Prof Ratna from UM. Uh, it's on their Facebook page, UM Dental Facebook page. She did a fantastic PowerPoint on diabetes and periodontitis. But I'm just going to sum up what she has said, basically. So diabetes, if you have it, you're about three times more likely to develop periodontitis. And if you have diabetes and periodontitis, your, your rate of destruction is going to be about two times more, uh, more quick. Now, the second main point is that there is a bi-directional link. It means it goes both ways. If you have diabetes, you're going to get periodontitis. If you have periodontitis, it's going to affect you with diabetes. I'm not going to go through the, 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 the details. Prof Ratna's lecture goes through really simply and, and, and very nice. Uh, and the, another main point is that if you're measuring it in terms of HbA1c, so there is a 0.3% increase in HbA1c if you have periodontitis. So what they're trying to say is that uh, your blood sugar control becomes worse if you have periodontitis. And what's really important is that if you treat periodontitis, you can have a reduction of 0.27 to 0.48, half a HbA1c level. I spoke, spoke to my colleague who is a doctor recently and he says that is a lot. That is really a lot, half. Um, 0.3 to 0.5 is a lot. Now, um, there we go. So now this is a clinical practice guidelines for the medical doctors that has uh, was only published in 2020 last year, December, and was only released January this year. Now you notice that there is a tooth on their guidelines. This is the first time ever that uh, diabetes or rather the medical has kind of taken dentists seriously first time ever uh, because i think in 2019 it was historic where there was a diabetes convention or whatever and they invited periodontists to go for that meeting so there is some changes and i think that is, is very good so again 
let's look into the clinical practice guide and see what the doctor thinks of us, right? So we know in our undergrad for the longest time that uh, there's a bi-directional link, but the doctors never knew that. Um, so, I mean, this is just the prevalence of diabetes in Malaysia. Malaysia is champion in Southeast Asia. Um, you don't need to know. Now, this is what I really want to show you. So look at recommendation number one. Oral health education should be provided to all patients, emphasizing increased risk of periodontal disease. And if you successfully manage periodontal disease, it will improve your uh, metabolic parameters. This is grade A evidence, means high evidence, kind of show the bi-directional thing. Now look at the second point. Uh, the doctors should investigate the presence of periodontal disease if they see a, peri uh, diabetes, a patient with diabetes. And if they do know that there's something wrong with their gums, prompt referral, referral should be made to the dentist for a periodontal examination. Now, how often do we do periodontal examination? I think based on this, I also believe that our undergraduate training should also change and uh, include periodontal examination. And look at point number three. Even if you're just newly diagnosed with diabetes, you need to refer for a periodontal examination as part of their management. Even if no periodontitis is diagnosed in, uh, initially, annual periodontal review is recommended. So basically, the doctors have put the ball in our court. And if we do not, if we neglect our duties, there is no more excuse now. If we neglect our duties, we will be in trouble. So in the court of law, I don't think, you know, uh, if the doctor has done his job and we misdiagnose periodontitis, we, are, we will be in trouble. Uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about smoking because smoking is a big factor in the new classification. Um, basically, I can give a whole lecture on smoking, but I'm just going to say that uh, you need to stop the smoking as well. Uh, evidence say that if you counsel, if you do a brief counseling, uh, you have a success rate of anywhere from 4 to 30. That's really low. That's why I say uh, it's a whole topic by itself. In any case, it is part of our. Uh, uh, treatment or management of periodontitis to actually address it. That means you cannot ignore it. You have to address it. You have to say you're smoking, don't smoke. Uh, the risk is anywhere from four to six times more if you smoke to get periodontitis. Now, I'm just going to show what they do in the UK because the support there is really good. In Malaysia, uh, not really. I've been asking around. Uh, they have some kind of school programs to target uh, uh, secondary school kids. To ask them to stop smoking. Uh, that's good, but uh, this is where I think the future may be, and I hope Malaysia can, can follow this. Just go to their website, smokefree.nhs, uh, smokefreenhs.com, right? And look at that, they even have an app. The app allows you to track your progress, see how much you're saving, get daily support. And if you go to their app, it's very non judgmental. Uh, just let me bring you to it. So uh, you get a free personal quick plan, you get, okay, get some information, and then you can find uh, a local support around you uh, and nothing is forced upon you and they only ask you three questions right and i'm going to show you what the three questions are first one is how soon after you wake up do you smoke your first cigarette that's it you know i don't even know how this information gets translated but yeah second question how many cigarettes do you smoke a day and the third one what have you used when you've tried to quit before and one of the answers here is never tried to quit before. But if you have tried, you know, what have you used? Da, 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 da. And then you click get, get your plan. They bring you to this uh, page where you can find expert support. So you can see this column here on the left uh, where you just key in your postcode, your address, well, your postcode. And then they will find the nearest kind of um, uh, uh, medical health clinic, uh, quick smoking clinic support and a support group for you immediately just link you up. All anonymous. You haven't even keyed in your phone number, you haven't even keyed in your, your email address, your name, your age, nothing. And um, they then provide e-cigarettes, which is another topic. I'm not going to cover it in this lecture. Uh, patches, uh, gums, and then also your support tools, like as I mentioned, the app. So I hope this will be in the future one day. Now, the third part of it is litigation and the ugly truth. What am I doing for time? Okay. Um, yeah. So I'm going to start off by saying in the UK, uh, and this taken uh, from a website. So people think that Americans like to sue dentists, but you'll be surprised that UK overtook them about three, four years ago. Um, dentists are getting sued left, right, center. And 
50% of it, as you can see, uh, sorry, 44%, almost half of it is because of undiagnosed or misdiagnosed periodontitis. So if we can say that this is the trend in the UK, which has surpassed the trend in the US, it should be coming to Malaysia very soon. So half of the people getting sued are because of undiagnosed perio. And I left in 2017, I think, and I think uh, that year itself, or 2016, um, there was a big article in the British press saying that this guy won uh, a whopping, I don't know how many million in the lawsuit because he was told, he wasn't told that he had periodontitis. So that also shocked me. And uh, what shocked me as well, one of my first few patients when I started working there was that I got a referral not from a dentist, but from a dental hygienist. So even the awareness among the dental hygienists is higher than the dentist here in Malaysia. So that is something to think about as well. Um, and in the UK, everybody complains about the GDC, which is equivalent to our MDC. Uh, my friends used to joke that they have a bulletin every month and you turn to the last page, the full page is of dentists being struck out or suspended. Every month, you got, I don't know, hundreds of dentists being struck out. Either suspended for six months, three months, one year, 10 years, or completely just struck off the list. And um, so people are very scared. People are very scared. People are more aware and then they refer. And therefore they have developed this, as you know, they, the, 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 the BPE is developed from the, the, the BSP, which is screening tool, uh, which I think, I believe our Malaysian government uh, now, from what I understand, they make people do this um, screening tool with the, the BPE. Uh, it's not a full charting, but it's better than nothing. It is considered in the UK as a minimum standard to do a BPE on, in adult patients. So anyway, in Malaysia, what's going on in Malaysia? Uh, again, Malaysia's data is not really updated. This was back in 2017. And that year itself, there were 11,250 new dentists. Uh, I believe now it's about, I don't know, maybe 1,000, 3,004 perhaps. I'm not sure this is not updated and I don't dare to say it. An article came out on Star last night and uh, they were using also the 2000, this data that I'm using. So it's not accurate. Um, anyway, my point is that it's going to be more saturated. And as you know, the government is getting more and more difficult to retain dentists. And therefore, whether you like it or not, you may very well be pushed into private practice. And that is pretty scary. So I will start off by uh, showing you a case that I saw this 50-year-old uh, lady came to me um, and she just, you know, she had braces done by an orthodontist and she, before she came, she wrote an email to the front desk and she said, I want to know how much is gum treatment by your dentist um, because I'm very upset. I want to sue my orthodontist, but I also want to know how much we charge because based on the price, I may go somewhere else. So I'm like, this is an angry patient, right? And so I told the front desk, I said, you have to just have to explain that. Um, I, it's not that I'm going to pull you on to treatment on the first visit. Usually we consult, we try to find out what's going on. I will charge you for consultation. You can tell her how much is my consultation, uh, but I'm not going to, to kind of... Uh, work on you, right? I have to come up with a treatment plan and then we can even negotiate the price then. So anyway, after some convincing, she came and she looked like this. So she said that she was told that she had gum disease after her braces was completed, after two and a half years. And we can see clearly, yes, at the posterior teeth, there is plaque, tata, but overall, not too bad, right? So I think, you know, um, but, but the fact is that, you know, an adult patient, you must always be careful. I believe in the UK, you, if you're going to start orthodontics on an adult patient, you must do a BPE before you start. That means they're making orthodontists do BPE as well. So there's no excuse. Um, yeah, so anyway, uh, this patient brought her uh, OPG, 
and this was before she did braces. Uh, yeah, I would say maybe not too bad, 5-10% bone loss at most. Uh, and this was after her braces. Yes, uh, there is quite a clear 10 to 20% uh, horizontal bone loss generally. And that explains the gap, that explains the teeth getting longer. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I see patients like this quite often. Uh, I diffuse them, you know, tell them, you know what, it's not so bad. You're lucky you have long roots. Uh, it's not the end of the world. And uh, for your age, it's actually quite a slow progressing uh, periodontitis. So, you know, got her down, sat her down, told her everything. I talked to her for hours. And uh, yeah, I hope things are better now. I think she's less angry. So, uh, what are the cases? So, I told you what is it like in the UK. What is it like in Malaysia? In Malaysia, look, at from 1997 to 2017, in the past 20 years, we've only had 193 complaints. That is, that is almost nothing. Um, they get hundreds of complaints every month in the UK. In the last 20 years, we got less than 200. Half of it is negligence, fraud, alleged incompetence. I don't know how many are due to perio, but maybe not. Uh, look, there's even one sexual molestation over oh, three there. So that's a bit um, funny, Malaysia. And of, even of all these 193 cases, uh, five were withdrawn, uh, four no action completed. So, you know, I, 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 the reason why I point out these statistics is that, and what I, explaining the case just before this is that there are patients brewing, there are litigation cases brewing. And don't, on the other hand, don't be complacent. Don't think that, ah, Malaysia, nobody sues anybody in Malaysia, so I can be, I'll be fine. Don't, no. I have many stories. They're all brewing. Uh, I've diffused many, I, I think. Uh, but, uh, yeah, try not to end up there. I think uh, I think PIDC would be uh, would be quite upset if they find out any of their students end up in hot water. So uh, this is another case that I saw last week. I didn't take clinical photos. I was so I didn't have time. But this is a similar case. As you can see, she is a thirty-five year old young, very pretty lady. Um, and in fact, her complaint was. I want to look better with the front teeth. And she saw a dentist. Her dentist referred this case to me. And I was like, oh my goodness, look at the amount of bone loss at the, at the posterior teeth, uh, even the premolars. Surprisingly, clinically, it didn't look so bad. So she didn't think she had a problem. And uh, when I told her all this and showed her the x-rays, and then she told me, only after that, I think a complete history, only after that she told me, she says, you know what? I had braces done seven, eight years ago. And I said, and she said, at that time, the dentist told me, uh, oh, you have uh, gum disease, but uh, you, do you want to do braces? If you want to do braces, yep, just sign this consent uh, and then we can do braces. And she wore braces for two years, two and a half years. Now, I am I cannot comment. I wasn't there. I, I never really, I, I only half believe patients' stories because uh, I'm not there. I'm always... I, I tend to side with the dentist. Um, so I don't know what happened. But uh, if she, what she says is true, then I can tell you in the future, your consent form does not work. Right? In the court, the lawyers will just swallow us up. So just be careful. Even if you get a signed consent, it means nothing. Um... So this is another case. Oh, sorry. Actually, no, before that. Uh, okay, I better kind of move on. Sorry. Okay. So this is another case which I saw a month ago. Uh, patient has been seeing his own dentist uh, for implants. You know, uh, a lot of implants in this case, as you can see, there's a missing 1-2 as well. Implant is placed there and then a missing 2-6 as well. And the next visit is to go back to the dentist to get these two implants restored. Sorry, the one to restore, the one, the two six to redo the implant bridge. The seven and the, the eight and the six are implants. 
from anyway. The, the two adjacent teeth next to the space that are implanted. So uh, why did this patient come? He's been seeing this that her, his own dentist for at least 20, 30 years. His wife has been seeing us for about 15, 20 years as well. So <laughs> there's competition between husband and wife. My dentist is better. No, my dentist is better. Um, so he has been complaining of uh, smell, halitosis for for a few months. And he's told his other dentist and nothing, it was not really addressed. And finally, the wife dragged him here. And at one glance, you can see at the one through there, you know, you can see this swelling here. I mean that, and the patient just said, no, I had my impressions taken last week and I'm going back next week to get the crown done. And I'm like, there's something wrong is there, right? And so I did my normal examination. I did my, my probing. I probe every patient that comes. Uh, this is a better picture here. You can see quite inflamed. And you notice at the area of the two seven area, that yellow discharge there, that is pus. And when I ask the question, patient has been feeling stuffy nose. So I suspect it has hit the sinus. Uh, and he says this pus happened ever since the implant was extracted. There was an implant there, so it's sectioned off, and then now they're planning to just do a bridge because apparently surgery was tried there, it failed again, so they said, let's just do a bridge. Now, I did my probing. I was um, quite shocked to find that there was a 15 millimeter probe being depth on the implant in front, and when I probed that thing there, tried to trace it, uh, zoop, I could feel it went into the sinus. And this patient going back next week to get the... the, the the restoration is done. This is the full mouth PA that I took. As you can see, the one, two implant here, there is radial lucency around the implant. Uh, so these things can happen. Just be very careful. Uh, I'm not going to comment on what other dentists do, but if this patient sees me, uh, this is early implant failure. Uh, and the, I don't think this can be saved. It has to be taken out. If not, it's going to cause more problems. Uh, the diagnosis I also had for the 27 is that it's an oral antrofistula with pus discharge coming out or sinusitis caused by odontogenic origin. Uh, and of course, there's peri-implantitis going on on the lower right. You can see a big tata there, 60% bone loss. Patient wasn't aware of all this. Uh, but yeah, you know, you just got to treat these patients. Um, be really careful not to offend anyone. Also, there's a big infection here. Can you see the three, four here? Root canal treated crown, big coast lesion there, patient starting to feel pain as well. Um, yeah, so these things can happen. <clears throat> uh, yeah, this is just a clearer picture as I can show you there. Yeah. Now, uh, this case, very unusual. I've seen many cases like this, but uh, I'm so happy that I got uh, fairly decent photos for this case. Now, at a glance, do you think this patient has periodontitis? I wouldn't think so, and I've been at this for about 10 years, well, seven, eight years now. Uh, but lo and behold, every patient, even if it looks like that or looks better, I still do a six-point pocket chart on adults, kids I don't do. Uh, and what did I find? It looks good, right? As you can see, oral hygiene is good. You know, no caries, looks like a responsible patient. Young, oh, she is 26 years old. And see what I get. I have uh, 10, 11 millimeters pocket on the upper right quadrant. I have uh, another nine millimeters on the upper left. In the anterior teeth, I have almost nine millimeters and that one I have 13 millimeters. I did my normal, I took my PAs and look at that. Um, advanced bone loss for the age, subgingival calculus, uh, vertical bone loss, this lower tooth where I got 13 millimeters, it has reached the apex of the tooth. The perioendal lesion, patient was experiencing pain, uh, but it just goes to show that a case like this, and I can tell you a case like this is more common than you think. I'm not plucking out one case out of 500 patients that I've seen. I can tell you this is very, very common, or rather more common than you think. So just be very careful. Yeah. Uh, so what I did for this patient uh, is that that uh, what was it again? The three one, the three. What was it again? The three two, yeah. So I extracted the three two because she came in. It was pain. Uh, I I can't do a denture there. It's too crowded. I'm not going to do an immediate implant. There's not enough bone. Uh, I'm not going to do a bridge there. I don't like bridge. 
Uh, so uh, what I did was I extracted the tooth, I cleaned out the infection, as you can see on the middle picture on the right. I put in some bone graft, I sutured the, the tooth. You can see Tata there, capillus uh, that was not removed. And this was the source of it. Also, there's a kind of a convex root on the proximal surface, and that's why it's more difficult for the dentist to clean. And then what I did was just, I cut her tooth. I, I sectioned off this tooth. I just kept the crown and then I just put some composite and did an autogenous bridge. Um, yeah, and, and she was happy. This is another case. I was referred earlier in the year, uh, in January, uh, and patient with the letter said that uh, uh, periodont periodontal abscess. And uh, the, the, the dentist did a deep clean on the patient and uh, it subsided a little bit, but after a month, it came back again. And then he just asked the patient to come with the diagnosis of periodontal abscess. I mean, okay, many of you are, most of you are students here. Is this a periodontal abscess or is this something really nasty, right? So anyway, uh, I sat the patient down and I said, this is not a swelling. This is a growth. And I just pause for a few seconds, stare deeply into the patient's eyes in a serious tone. I quickly got him for a biopsy. And yes, the di the, the I sent it to uh, I sent it to Prince Court Hospital because uh, I think UM's UM doesn't do certain things. Well, anyway, or they were shut down for that period of time or something. Uh, usually, I we send it to UM, but anyway, it came out as squamous cell carcinoma, and I was upset because uh, this so-called abscess or swelling was detected end of November. By the time I I saw the patient end of January, by the time the the biopsy results came out, it was February. The you know this could have been caught three four months ago, and it wasn't. Uh, so what I did was I arranged uh, immediately for an oncologist team, uh, had Zoom meetings with them, you know, tell them this guy is urgent, send the CBCD, send the biopsy, send everything. Uh, and they got him up quite quickly for an appointment. And by the way, this patient's son is a dentist practicing in Australia. He's never seen his, hasn't seen his son for many years, especially now in the pandemic. So I told him, I said, you better sit down and have a chat with your son. Uh, I'm happy to talk to him as well. But um, yeah, these things happen. Uh, so he's got a consult. Thankfully, it was only stage. Uh, the, I mean, it didn't spread yet. But I don't know what happened to him. I need to find out. So now, <clears throat> uh, sorry for all the gloomy stuff. I have like 10 minutes left, 13 minutes left. Uh, I'm just going to show you some of my cases and hopefully end this with a very light note. So if you think Perio is boring, uh, I'm going to show you what I do in practice. Okay, so this is a, a okay, let's stop this. So this is a video here. Uh, let's see. On the left hand side, which I'm going to play, can you see the, the, the kind of uh, gums there? Uh, yeah, so <laughs> the patient was very shocked. And what has happened the story goes is that the patient went to see a dentist and the dentist said ah that's fine just do a laser charged a bomb for it uh had laser done she was quite happy that it went down but then within a couple of weeks it came back up again like that uh and uh we saw her or one of my colleagues actually dr leong Yixian, saw her and then he got a full normal did his normal charting did x-rays medical history and found out that she was on uh, what was this one of those five she was one of those uh, now i can't remember there, there are only like four drugs that you will know during your viva that you have to know for your viva for the gum swelling i can't remember what was which one she took um but anyway so what dr leong did was just say you know what go and see your doctor and change your medication without even touching her. Anyway, he did uh, treat her in the end, medication changed. And just by the first round of non-surgical, 
if she noticed the difference, she was so happy. It's uh, more effective than the laser and a fraction of the price. So what happened, this patient, he then referred it up to me, on to me. Uh, I did gum surgeries. Sorry if this looks a bit uh, scary for a Sunday morning for those who haven't had breakfast. Um, I basically raised the flat. I, I, there's granulation tissue here on the, the top. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but anyway, that's a little difficult to extract. Uh, sorry, to remove. And then once it's clean, it looks like this. I put a little bit of, of bone, um, a xenographic bone particulate, and then I sutured it. This is, I did full mouth. So this is the upper right. This is the upper left. Similarly, my incisions, I raised the flap. Uh, I did a papilla preservation flap. I uh, removed the granulation tissue. It looked like this. I believe I added some bone. I don't have the photos. And then I sutured. It's really difficult to take photos when you're doing surgery. It's, it's, it's enough, difficult enough to take photos during non-surgery when you're all sterile and stuff. Uh, so this is quite an achievement itself. Uh, lower right quadrant as well, uh, incisions, um, uh, cleaned up the granulation tissue. I decided halfway that the 3-7, sorry, the 4-7 couldn't be saved. And then I did an extraction as well. I softened, I rich preserved the area with some bone graft and I sutured with PTFE suture. Three months post-op, she looks like this. Uh, I think, I think it was quite good. So her main concern, I forgot to say, her main concern was that actually she wanted to look pretty. So I'm like, no, hold on. You have more serious issues than looking pretty. Uh, but anyway, she was so pushy. She was like, she's, she's very nice. She was like, can I do my braces? Can I do orthodontic? I'm like, uh, you know. But anyway, she managed to, I, I gave in. I referred to one of my orthodontic colleagues uh, and they started braces for her. So you can see she looks really good now, really clean. Uh, big difference. I was quite happy. I would have preferred to wait six months. But I think we started a little bit early uh, because she was also pushing my orthodontist. In the end, it was just under six months. I think I don't know, maybe five months we started. So um, orthodontics, perio auto can work, but uh, this is probably for another lecture. Orthodontic uh, treatment has to be modified a little bit. You can't move the things too quickly. You have to, patients has to be really tip up in your condition. In fact, you can see here, there's a little bit of plug buildup here already. We're not happy. So we keep sending her, well, send her back to Dr. Leong to do the maintenance uh, to clean for her. Uh, another thing that we that I do, I don't like to remove wisdom teeth, but in this case I did. Uh, apologies for this slide. This is not an OPG, this is actually part of the CBCT. Uh, you can see the 3738. Now in a case like this, uh, you know, classically one option, uh, that is popular is that you remove both the seven and eight because the seven is is also gone to the tip of the apex and that's exactly what happened to his left side you can see the six is there seven is is missing eight is missing so i'm like no i'm not going to let this happen but i don't like doing uh, wisdom teeth but i said no i have to because uh, i know what's going to happen if you don't so uh I took a CBCT, uh, the picture on the left here, we can see that the infection uh, is distal to the seven root, but then there is still a very good lingual plate. And this cross section, this 10 slices of cross section here, you can also see that the lingual plate is there, big infection, far from the nerve. So what I did was basically I said, hey, you know what, this, I can grow some bone back. So which is what I did. Uh, <clears throat> so I hate doing wisdom teeth like that, barely visible, no space to work at on just the, the cusp there that is visible. I raised the flap very conservatively, gutted very, very conservatively. Periodontists like to make our lives difficult. We gutter, we take so long, and then we remove the tooth, clean it out, dig out the granulation tissue, put some local antibiotics, flush the area, get some good blood, and then I put in bone graft. And then look, even I can't suture properly. I had no keratinized tissue, so I had to suture a little bit of the buccal mucosa. But I really had no choice, if you can see pre-op. Uh, oh, before that, as you can see, there's a temporary filling on the 7. I got Dr. Leong to extirpate the pulp because I said he's going to be in pain and he extirpated the pulp. I'm still waiting for the results. Uh, as you can see here, then they kind of did the, the obturation there. And uh, oh yeah, this, sorry, this actually is not very clear. You can see distal to this 7 here, there's a lot of bone. So I did manage to grow back bone all the way and I'm quite happy. I filled up the whole area with bone. It's just that now it's become a 
chronic apical periodontitis, and then hopefully obturation will solve the case. Um, yeah, I will wait for six months before I reprobe again, and I would like to take an x-ray and, and hopefully uh, see a, a, a case like that. I have another case done recently, very similar as well. well um, okay, since this topic is a little bit about future, yeah, uh, this was a uh, 20, no, about a 30-year-old lady. She had tongue tied her whole life, but she says, I want to learn a new language. Uh, and uh, she wanted to learn Spanish, and she said, I can't roll my R, my R's. So she says, please do something about it. <clears throat> and uh, so that's what I did, basically. Straightforward. Now, uh, a little bit to implant dentistry. Sorry, I'm going to run. Okay, I've got six minutes. That's good. <clears throat> okay, implant dentistry. Uh, so these are the cases that I, I get. Uh, so, you know, if you're in a parallel practice or you decide to do perio or work in a perio clinic, uh, you will see cases like that. So this is a case of a hypodontia. So you can see the retained deciduous uh, 8, 5, 8, 4, yeah, 3, 4, 5, 8, 5. And uh, so this is what the x-rays look like. Uh, a lot of bone, but sometimes hypodontia is not as easy as it looks. But anyway, uh, what I wanted to show you is that how we are moving forward in the future where we are designing with digital. So uh, the anterior posterior position, the buccal lingual position, the width, the diameter of the implant, everything can be planned. It is still has its flaws. Don't follow digital dentistry blindly. And if anybody tells you to follow digital dentistry blindly, don't follow him because we are still at the very beginning, but this is the future. Um, but well, anyway, uh, I'm going to show you how we design this. Uh, just a quick video. Uh, we take a tree shape scan, we superimpose it with the CBCT, and then we can kind of plan uh, the position of it. And then what they will do is they will 3D print a surgical guide or a surgical stent. And then, yeah, basically just drilling the implant in. Um, so with this technology, uh, you know, the gap between post-surgery and uh, surgical skills are, are reduced, especially if technology improves. But again, this is just one aspect of, of uh, implant dentistry. Don't think that you can place it surgically well or prosthodontically positioned well. You can place implants. There is a whole lot of things to know. Um, that's my next slide. So anyway, this patient, if you notice the, oh, did I have a clinical picture? Yeah, so if you notice that not only implant, yeah, this is what I want to point out as well. So there's soft tissue deficiency as well. Uh, from the buccal lingual side, it's kind of deficient inwards. And then the amount of keratinized tissue is about 1, 1 1.5 millimeters. So what's going to happen is that, yes, you can place an implant in a good position, but because of the lack of keratinized tissue, the patient is not going to be able to brush. Evidence say that we need at least two millimeters. And what's going to happen is that you're going to have a nice implant, but seven years down the road, you're going to get periimplantitis. You don't know why. And then I'm going to get that referral. <laughs> so uh, what we did, or rather what I did, was to put a connective tissue graft. I harvested it from the pellet. Uh, kind of split a little bit. I placed it on the buccal side and sutured it. Uh, yeah, it wasn't good, but well, anyway, I managed to get about one millimeter. Uh, this was the implant that I placed. It looked much better. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, we'll see. Uh, I've referred this patient back to her dentist to restore the crown. So unfortunately, I won't see that. The, 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 I won't see this case through. Uh, last thing I would like to say is that uh, I do a lot of alveolar ridge preservation, uh, which is all commonly known as socket preservation. So extractions that you that we have learned are outdated, are getting outdated. Uh, for the past 20 years, the only the Americans believed that socket preservation works with limited evidence. Europe was against it. There's no evidence, you know, it was still resolved. There's no point putting anything in there. You, you know, don't go against nature. The bundle bone will, will not uh, stay. So, but now just last week, the EFP has come out with a statement saying that it might work. So for global trends to change, it is 
very difficult. It's going to be, although this technology or this idea was at least 20 years old, it's probably going to be another 10 years before this is routine. Now, the only drawback for this is that I suppose it's very high cost uh, and um, uh, technique sensitive, right? This looks easy, but trust me, it's not easy. The extraction took four seconds to come out with a loose tooth, um, but digging out, curating the, the socket, removing the granulation tissue, careful not to perforate the sinus, takes me 30 to 40, sometimes one hour alone just to dig it out, make sure it's absolutely clean. I have not raised the flap. Um, and then I have to assess the defect. In this case, the buccal bone was gone. So I had to put a collagen membrane, as you can see in the third picture here. And then I put particular particulate uh, graft and then I sutured. And the picture on the, on the right-hand side there, you know, this is beautiful. It, it shows that the granulation tissue, they all don't often come out like that. But when they do, sorry, when they don't, you have to dig it out. And they are really, really, really difficult. Stubborn, like I said, I think half an hour to 45 minutes to, just to dig out a small piece. Uh, I have loops on. I make sure I have very good suction retraction because if you leave any granulation tissue inside there, you put an expensive bone graft inside there, you charge the patient till the end, it's going to fail. And how are you going to justify it to your patients? So, but this is going to be, I believe the future very soon. Just another case, uh, this tooth needed to go. Uh, it was next to an implant. There's also a PA vision on the tooth in front on the four, five, which, uh, well, anyway, and you can see buckle swelling there. Uh, buckle wall was gone again. It took me so long to clean out. Uh, I put a membrane there. I put a bone graft on the bottom left, and then I sutured. And look, three months later, it healed really nicely. The bottom right picture. So uh, what happened is I continued, I placed the implants in grafted sites. I managed to maintain the bone. In fact, there was still a little bit deficient on the buckle, uh, but because it was minor, I could graft it and put a membrane and suture it. If I did not do the preservation before, during the extraction, I doubt I could do this. I, could, I probably needed to do a block graft or some else or maybe a titanium mesh go in six months again uh, but yeah uh, that's the x-ray of the implant so before i end uh, on the high just want to show what i do this is i don't know if this is considered advertising if it is i'm so sorry but uh i just wanted to end on the high this is the clinic that i work the practice that i work at in kl <clears throat> We have a tree shape scan, uh, which is I use for my implant cases. Uh, CBCT, CBCT, and then we have a milling 3D machine. Uh, we were the first in Malaysia to get that machine, but I'm going to stop the video here. And lastly, is perio for you, or you know whether you specialize or not. There is a future in perio, I believe, and. Uh, I think we need to catch up if we still don't believe. And uh, this is my team. Uh, you can recognize Dr. Leong there. Uh, he has helped me. Without this team, I am I wouldn't be able to get all these cases. I wouldn't be able to. It all seems nice like I do it, but I can tell you the things that I don't tell you is the support team behind me. Uh, I'm very grateful for them. Uh, and uh, yeah, so whether you decide to do perio or even not perio or specialize or even do auto or even do prosto, you know, there's always a place for you in the future. And with that, I thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Eugene, for the captivating and insightful presentation. Really leaves us thinking the whole time. Like I found myself nodding most of the time, eyes glued to the screen because it really is interesting. So um, we are now going to begin answering the questions submitted by the audience. Uh, let's take a look in the chat box. There's one question from Serene Fong. 
And she asked, doctor, what's the treatment rendered for the first case shown with black triangles and 5 to 10% bone loss? Which case was this again? Oh, I see. Yeah, so I think it's that, that case that did auto. Um, so I told her, I said, the first step is you need to stabilize your periodontitis. So I coached her for oral hygiene instruction. I say, you honestly haven't been brushing well. Um, and that's also one reason. So don't don't blame your orthodontist, right? You have to kind of take some responsibility. Obviously, I don't speak like that, right? But that's just the idea. Uh, and uh, I do what I do, which is non-surgical treatment. Uh, do a deep clean. Uh, make sure the hygiene is... Um, the, the plug score is below 15%. And then I reassess again in six to eight weeks, which I haven't. That's why I'm, I'm talking in the future tense. Uh, so what's going to happen? I'm going to expect that she is stable and I'm going to expect that her brushing, her brushing has been improving. So that's good. So then I'm going to sit her down and tell her this. I said, look, the main issue, the underlying cause, which is your periodontitis, is arrested for now. But you have the susceptibility, meaning that periodontitis can happen Anytime down the future, if you drop with your brushing. So that needs to, to be seared into your mind. Because I said, you come and see me twice a year or three times a year or whatever, but the other 360 days, you need to, to brush your teeth. So I said, fine, that's stable. Now, what are we going to do to move on? So I, how I would manage this case is that, look, there's black triangles, so it's a cosmetic issue. And, or aesthetic, and with cosmetic aesthetic, I don't like to do it. I'll probably refer it to a dentist who dares to do it. Uh, so her options in this case is obviously no more auto, because I think the auto was actually really good. Her teeth are positioned quite well. And the other two options you have is to do composite buildup uh, or composite veneers. And, but I don't think this patient wants it because um, it's the lower smile line, right? You know, black triangles, when you smile, she had the low smile line. I told her, I said, you are very conscious about it because you look at it in the mirror. But hey, when you smile, you don't really see it. So do you really need to do it? You know, we don't, we shouldn't do things just for the sake of doing it. Um, yeah, so uh, I haven't reached that stage yet, but that's what I'm going to do. The other option is to put a gingival veneer, which is something like your acrylic denture, just the pink part wearing it. Uh, that is more conservative, but uh, that is another discussion. But yeah, I would basically section this case into, I solve the perio underlying perio first, and then whatever cosmetic is, um, to me is not, yeah, to me cosmetic is cosmetic. It's a different department of dentistry. Okay, hope that answers the question. Also, the next question is also from Serin Fong. Uh, she asked, uh, doctor, for the 3-2 extraction case, can RCT and perio treatment be attempted since the tooth has endoperio lesion? Oh, wow. Hey, that's a very good question. Um, for that case, no. Uh, but the case where I showed, for example, the, um, the, the wisdom tooth case where I did, where I actually did do, uh, ask Dr. Leong to extirpate the pulp and then I I, I grafted the area uh, because there is a perioendo lesion. Now, what makes me decide whether I do that or extract is whether I have enough walls in my defect. So, for example, in that, that wisdom tooth case, the CBTT showed that I had good lingual wall, I had good buccal wall, I had good distal wall. Uh, if I'm going to put anything in there, it's going to stay. Whereas this tree too, there was, the whole wall was gone. So, even if I were to treat perio, how is the bone going to go back, grow back? Um, very, very unlikely. I mean, there is a study that has, uh, that has come out, uh, a 10-year survey, 10-year uh, study by Cotellini. Cotellini is the god of regen, so we all perio people say. Um, and he has taken up hopeless teeth cases, hopeless prognosis teeth cases, and he claims that he has like, I don't know, 80-90% success rate in 10 years. So cases like this, he will attempt. Um, is it possible? Biologically, yes, maybe. But uh, my hands are not Cotellini's hands. Um, the patients don't have the same support, the same kind of hygienist. Malaysia don't even have hygienists compared to him. Uh, and he does his surgeries under microscope. I have yet to try that. Uh, mm -hmm. So is it possible biologically? Yes. But then in this case, based on my expertise, 
no, I think there's only one person in the world that will dare to try it, and that's not me. So, yeah, case to case basis. Okay, I think we have a lot of questions. Oh, okay. so don't mind answering it now. Yeah, I'm okay. very happy to. Okay, oh. so then, uh, yeah, the next question. Um, I think. Yeah. Directed to the next Yeah, yeah. These are the three. Yeah, so these are like viva answers. But um, I think she now I remember. I think she was on uh, uh, Dipin. That's the other one. That's probably the former. She's on Dipin. Okay, okay, shall we we'll just proceed to the next one? Uh, yeah. Doctor, how long can the crown cemented as temporary measure for three two extraction case stay? <laughs> uh, so well, uh, this is this is the best time to under promise over deliver. So I tell the patient, look, this is just temporary. Don't buy an apple, don't use that. If it breaks now, pandemic, I don't know how you're gonna come back. Uh, and then when I cemented it, I make I uh, sorry, when I Attached it, I made sure I shave it off occlusion. I mean, the tooth is out, so I can just shave it. Uh, how long can it stay there? Uh, it really depends how well the patient uses, whether the patient is a bruxer or not. In this case, I think she can last quite long. Uh, I would say one example is, uh, it happened to my mom as well. You know, one of her front tooth was taken out and she has had it for eight years. <laughs> so I also don't know what to say, right? You know. Uh, I need you to place an implant for her as well, but you know the thing has been there for eight years. So I don't know. Sometimes they come out if they brux or you know it's, it's hard to say. But under promise and over deliver, manage expectation. Mm. All right. Okay. Um. Next question from Miss Subashini. What local antibiotic did you use for this subject? Uh. So I used uh, tetracycline. Uh, is there evidence? Uh, I we are extrapolating evidence from the local antibiotics used in non-surgical barrier treatment. So as you know, non-surgical, which is your ultrasonic scaling, your curettes, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, whether or not you use it with systemic antibiotics or whether or not you use local antibiotics, the whole debate is going on. Uh, systemic will be what Amox and Metro shows the most evidence up to nine months. Uh, local uh, is very tricky, but uh, after going through a few systematic reviews, uh, tetracycline seems to be the highest. So, um, yeah, but it's a tetracycline brand only found in the US. So I don't know, nobody knows how to get that brand, but uh, we just use tetracycline to substitute uh, and hopefully that works. I mean, so far it's been working for me. So whether there's evidence, I don't know. But yes, I use tetracycline, extrapolated evidence from the systematic reviews from the non-surgical treatment. Okay, uh, we shall answer a few more from the chat box and proceed with the Q&A by the anonymous attendee. Next question, a very long one from Muhammad Akmal. Uh, doctor, as we all know, periodontal therapy, uh, albeit the importance, is not really famous among the public, unlike orthodontics and restoration. In this regard, did the KKM or MDC or any NGO help? Uh, periodontics to promote the consultation and the second one you know in your opinion will this field get more attention among general practitioner and public in the future i certainly yeah. hope so um the government is doing a lot i would say you know uh, it's just that uh oh okay uh earlier on remember i mentioned that uh, the estimated budget to treat periodontitis per year was 32.5 billion, which is about 2,800 ringgit per person. Um, this estimate was 60% over the budget that MOH gives peril people. So there you go, right? So are they doing uh, enough? I suppose your question is that are they doing enough? I would say they are doing all that they can. They're restricted by money. They're restricted by politics. They are, of course, restricted by manpower as well. Um, but I would say Perio is doing well for itself. Or that's what I like to think. You know, uh, of all the specialties, you know, Malaysian Society of Perio has been around for some time and then they're quite active. Um, and in fact, even if you look at the University for Postgraduate Studies, Perio has always been there. Endo just started in UKM. 
uh, it shows you that they, they, from Resto, they have been now branching out to mono specialties, but Perio has always been there. So I think we have a good, strong uh, foundation of periodontists, but the, the total number of periodontists in Malaysia, I would say it's only about 80, 90 of us or less than 100 of us. So it's not many for the whole country of 32 million. Um, we are just very young in dentistry. Uh, and uh, now with the COVID situation like this, money is going to be an issue. Um, I don't expect KKM to focus on perio the next decade because there are more important things than gums, right? As much as I don't like to say that. Uh, second question, in my opinion, will this still get more attention among general practitioners in the public? I sure hope so. And this is the reason why I gave this lecture. Um, I hope everybody sees it um, because the whole world is waking up. Even the economists have woken up. Even the doctors have wake, woken up. Um, the dentists are not waking up. So uh, there is, a, sorry, I may sound offensive, but uh, there is um, a statistic I can't quote and I can't remember properly, but it is something like um, the, the percentage of dentists doing full mouth per pocket chart or even screening for gum disease, don't even talk about the full six point pocket chart, screening for gum disease is a measly, don't know how many percent. So I, it is tough, it is difficult, Perio is boring, nobody understands it. I don't even understand it fully, but yes, I do hope it gets attention. Um, uh, and yeah, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, next question from Lavanian. Hi, Doctor, for gingival recession, is there any new techniques that are used nowadays? Oh, yes. Uh, that's a very good question. So, uh, oh. new techniques. Let's see. I suppose the very famous one in Malaysia is called the Vista technique, uh, where it's created by this American guy. And then he lectures in America. He came to Taiwan, he opened it, and then that's why Malaysia is popular. But I can tell you all these funny techniques. The evidence is not strong. Um, the, best, the, the best place to do gingival recession in the world today is actually in Florence, Italy. That's the most concentrated group of people really doing recession there. And I was lucky, fortunate enough to be taught by them. And why do I say it's not that I'm biased, but I would say 80, 90% of the, the published data for the last 30 years have come out from Florence, Italy. And um, <clears throat> why do they stick to all these old techniques? Is because they work. All these new techniques, they don't have 10 year randomized control trials. Uh, so you have to be careful with certain techniques. Um, yeah. Uh, traditionally is still the modified calf, which is a lot of incisions and then you kind of pull it up. Uh, tunneling technique is popular, it's very popular in America, it's getting more and more popular in Europe. Um, and this Vista technique, which is a combination of actually these two. So I would say those are the probably the newer techniques. I mean, in terms of biomaterials, yes. So sometimes when we pull a calf, we have different biomaterials like um, Last time we used to harvest graft, or I rather I harvested graft from the pellet. We have now um, uh, Allo Plus materials. I use those. They look like the sponge from the kitchen clinic. It's so thick, it can't be used. Um, but yeah, we're still very new in developing techniques. So that's what I would say. Okay, thank you, Doctor. Oh, we, we passed 20 minutes from the oh. time. Yeah. But there are a lot of interesting questions uh, by our audience. Oh, sorry, okay, there's more questions, is it? Yeah, there are a lot. So, oh, there are a lot. Okay, yeah, I'll answer yeah. Uh, Sorry. Okay. Uh, I think we'll take one more for the live session, and the rest we will definitely attend to it after. Okay, good, good. good. Yeah, I'll so one... faster, sorry. <laughs> it's interesting, yeah. So next one by Dugashini. Hi, doctor. Thanks for the interesting presentation. I would like to know how effective would be the bone graft by using patient's own tooth, since some doctors are practicing it in their treatment. Yeah, so uh, the, the, what they do is they take the tooth up, they grind it, and they use it as particular bone graft. So uh, you need to go back to the basics to understand why they do that. Uh, it's because bone graft, any material, there are three properties, right? Osteoconduction, osteoinduction, and osteogenesis. 
So what I used was xenograft, which is purely osteoconduction, it means that there's no cells, it's not inductive, and it's not your own body, it's not, uh, 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 what's the word now, it's not, um, uh, it doesn't, it's not your own bone, basically. So uh, osteoconductive just means a scaffold. The scaffold just means that you want to put a buffer long enough for it to, <clears throat> to stay in place for the healing to take place. It's basically, um, yeah, that's what a scaffold means. Uh, to maintain the space long enough for the healing to take place. So it has actually no other properties. It has no cells and stuff like that. So if you use a patient's tooth, it is also a slow resorbing material, let's say, and you crush it, you make it into bone, you put it inside the bone graft. In theory, biologically, it works. Uh, in fact, it might be slightly better because you, you may have some cells. The periodontal ligament cells are still attached there, so there may be some inductive properties. But, um, I mean, how am I going to, to blend the tooth? So that is one issue. I mean, if I use a bone crusher and stuff, and if I'm going to extract a tooth that is already periodontally compromised, such as the tooth that I extracted, there was a big piece of tata in there, I don't want to put tata back into the socket. Right? So uh, the question to answer you is biologically, yes, it does make sense. Uh, it's cheaper, you're using your own tooth, blah, 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 blah. But you have to also be very careful, make sure there's, there's no this and that. Uh, and then if you want to look at evidence, I don't think there's much, any robust evidence out there. So my practice is that if I do not see enough evidence, I wouldn't use it. But it's not that I don't believe it. I will just, I'm just not convinced. Wow. <laughs> Doctor, can you see the, the, the rest of the questions? Uh, um, oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, oh, it's okay. Uh, I think we can, yeah, due to time constraints. Okay. Yeah, I know, I'm very happy to stay in the, if, if, yeah. Okay, let's, let's just start. Um, yeah, due, due to time constraints, I think we are unable to answer more questions live. But for the remaining questions, don't worry, we'll definitely attend to that. Since we okay. don't really have much time left, we will liaise with Dr. Eugene, the mine, <laughs> and have him answer the questions after the webinar. I'm pretty sure my colleagues are in this webinar right now. So can some of you save the questions that have not been addressed? And we will get back to you with the answers via email, or we will post it in our Instagram page. Uh, are we not going to answer it? Pardon? Are we not going to answer them? Uh, we will. We will. Oh, we will. Okay, okay. So the time allocated is... Um, 11 to 12 through the poster. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm afraid right. they have yeah. other plans. But um, can we answer it after this and we'll send it through the social media platform? Through Instagram. Oh, I see. That means I'm going to answer this recorded and it's going to send to the. Either recorded or type. I think both should be fine. Uh, Is it okay? okay. Uh, why don't we do until 12 30? It's another eight minutes. See how many I can answer. Uh, all right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, um, Okay, next. Hmm. Do local antibiotics work? I've previously been told that it has no significant difference compared to parallel surgery without it. Would like to hear your thoughts, thanks. Okay, antibiotics like any other product that any company tries to sell to you, none of it are magic powder. There's no magic potion or magic powder, right? Uh, you have to get the basics right, meaning that um, if the surgery is predictable, if the surgery has like three walls, uh, narrow defect, uh, clean, good hygiene, blah, blah, this and that. Honestly, you don't even need antibiotics. It will definitely work. But if you think that, uh, you know, in those kind of severe compromise case, I need to put antibiotics and then you're comparing, it's not comparing uh, like for like. So what I'm saying is that um, I extrapolate the evidence from the data to say that it, it does work. It's not exactly direct evidence. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, so that's why you get very varying results. And some practitioners don't believe it, some do. Uh, if you ask me, I don't know. So yeah, next one. Uh, sorry. Is uh, a full mouth PA superior in terms of periodontal assessment compared to OPG? Yes, definitely. Definitely, definitely. Uh, that would be the gold standard and I would, I would kind of go for it. But of course, any x-ray, and if you look at the guidelines, the Sedentex guidelines says that you take x-rays if you are not sure and if you require more information. So just stick to that the guidelines, stick to the ALARA or ALADA principle. 
Um, but yes, I'm very biased to say that I would prefer a PA any day over OPG for periodontal assessment. Mm. Okay, so the next one, I think we answered it just now. Okay, good. Yeah, uh, let's see. Okay, this one done as well. Okay, from uh, Chi Ho. Hello, doctor. You briefly talked about how signed consent forms offer little protection in the court of law. Could you please expand upon that? Yeah, thank you for the excellent talk. Okay, <laughs> Okay. so uh, it has never happened to me before. So whatever that I am saying is all hearsay. Um, but this is what I keep getting because you know that the litigation uh, in the UK, so these are what I hear from my friends who are working there. And they say, no, that is a written consent, but it's not, how the lawyers were twisted is that it's not informed consent if the patient doesn't understand. We think that informed consent means if I inform the patient that is consent, but the, the, the UK, they are very particular about this word. Informed consent means the patient is informed of what is going on. The patient can, can repeat what is going on, what are the risks and this and that. And when I was practicing, I can tell you I had to go through the whole charade before every surgery. I'll say, ah, good morning, what am I going to do to you? And say, I'm going, going to do a surgery on this side. Okay, what are the side effects? Bleeding, bruising, swelling, infection. My patients are like, you know, so they sound so professional already. This, this, and, that. and then we have to do this. I have to sign this. The nurse has to sign. My supervisor has to sign. Okay, I'm going to do this on you. Then we start. I need like at least 15 minutes before I can even do the surgery, even if the sixth time I'm doing surgery on this patient, right? So that is what it means by informed consent. So yeah. <clears throat> okay. Uh, next question. Uh, doc, how well can root planning stop bone re resorption? Do you routinely recommend your patient to do root planning? Stop bone resorption? What is bone resorption? Bone resorption? Bone loss due to periodontitis? If you remove the source, your bone will not resolve. Unless you're talking about... Wait, let's see again. How well can root planning stop bone resorption? Uh, okay, I think I know what this means. That means how effective is non-surgical treatment. So uh, if you get all the parameters correct, meaning that if you remove the etiology, you control the systemic risk factors, the patient is brushing well, it should stop. Uh, it should stop. And But the, the question is that how well uh, yeah, we don't know, to be honest. And that's the reason why even if a patient is so-called stable, every year I will do a six-point pocket chart and compare. So 2020, I got one. 2021, I got one. 2022, I got one. 2023, I can say, hey, look, this one is deteriorating on this spot here. I need to deep clean this spot. And then, etc., etc. I don't do the whole deep cleaning on the whole patient again. So do I routinely recommend to do root cleaning? Only if I have to, because I always tell patients, I hope I only have to do this to you once. Um, but a lot of it depends on the patient itself. So, yeah. Okay, let's move on with the next one. Uh, by Hong Sang, would like to know further, how do you handle cases that were referred or came in for second opinion with possibility of litigations against the previous dentist? So, there is this uh, talk that I've been to, uh, dentists who have now become lawyers and helping uh, patients sue other dentists. <laughs> And basically, the statistics say that uh, a lot of patients want to sue is because they were actually not, they, nobody actually listened to them. You know, when we talk about communication, is how I speak, how I tell you. But I can tell you one great tip that will carry you for life is that listening is part of communication. Keeping quiet, listening is part of communication. And sometimes that's all the patient wants. Patient comes in really stressed, coming to see a dentist. You need to listen, diffuse the situation. So I just keep quiet. I just listen to her. You know, I know she's angry, you know, blah, blah, blah. Just let her talk to me, right? There's a, there's a stats that say that we dentists tend to, tend to interfere with our patients every six or seven seconds. So that's quite annoying, right? I know we want to be limited with time, but, you know, like I said, I spend two hours with this patient. So what do I do? I try to diffuse the situation and, and just look forward. I always say, okay, this is what happened. Just forget it. What are we going to do next? What are we going to do next? Keep on pushing, looking forward, looking forward. That's my strategy. Hope that answers the question. Okay, one last for the live session. Okay. Uh, morning, Dr. Kuo. Thank you for your ses uh, session. 94% of Malaysians suffers from periodontal disease. I want to start screening and identify patients that may be suffering from the disease. Any advice on what I can do to start this practice? And second one, I 
often hear people say that periodontitis is a diagnosis for life. Is this true? If yes, uh, when does the treatment stop? Uh, a simple question number one, a simple way is uh, the BPE, uh, basic periodontal examination. I think we learned that, or rather I think I learned that in PIDB. Yeah. So if not, then the website is very, very clear. It's uh, basically using a different kind of probe, a ball and probe, and you're only putting by sections and you're giving, you're measuring a score, the highest score in each section. Sectant. And actually the BPE, what people don't understand that it's actually a screening tool to refer, meaning that if you've got three or four, you're supposed to refer. So if you read the whole BPE process, if you get this what it's supposed to do, you get this what it's supposed to do, uh, that would be a great way to start. Minimal cost, it takes less than five minutes, three minutes to do that. Second question, I often hear people say paranoid. Is a diagnosis for life. Is this true? Is yes. When does treatment stop? Never, right? We need to make money, right? No. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, when you put it that way, it sounds bad. Let me give you an analogy. If you see a patient, patient comes in today, and then you see attrition on the lower anterior teeth. So the diagnosis is tooth wear or attrition. Now, can you cure attrition? The answer is that you can prevent and you can treat, but you cannot cure attrition. Sure, you take composite and build it up, but that's treating, that's not uh, uh, curing. So in that sense, attrition's diagnosis is a diagnosis for life as well. Periodontitis is the same, don't make it sound so doom and gloom. It can be prevented and it can be treated. And basically it can be kind of controlled in that way. Uh, if yes, then when does treatment stop? Never, because uh, but this is a serious thing. It, it never is because uh, we know that there's multifactorial and a lot of it is um, your systemic. So for example, if let's just say you see a patient 50 years old, yeah, you've controlled the disease. Da, da, da. Maybe when he's 60 years old, he suddenly develops diabetes. He suddenly develops uh, heart disease or, you know, develops some autoimmune disease. And so you need to monitor because genetically they have that susceptibility for life. And I believe that is the reason why it's also important to, okay, yeah, fine, going back. It's very long diagnosis for life. The answer is yes. Uh, and this is very important for that reason because your graph is not always uh, uh, proportional. Yeah. yeah. Very interesting. Okay, so um, I think that's it for the live session. For the remaining ones, uh, we will attend to, to that. Uh, my colleagues have already saved the questions and we will post the answers in the Instagram page, okay? Ooh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that marks the end of today's session. I hope all of you have enjoyed it and find it beneficial. I do. Thank you so much, Dr. Eugene. It was a pleasure to have you with us. It was my pleasure. And thank you. <laughs> thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. Do follow our Instagram page because we will keep you updated with the upcoming events, apart from the infographics that we are going to share, as well as the answers for the unaddressed questions. We will definitely keep in touch and get interactive through IG stories. Thank you once again and enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Bye. When do I answer these? Huh? Sorry, oops. <laughs> Um, Dr. Eugene, I'll contact you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. You have my number? Yes, I do. Okay.